The following presentation is brought to you by KMmedia.pro. Please visit KMmedia.pro for more information. Now stay right where you are as we present. Welcome to Positive Talk Radio, evolving ideas, one conversation at a time. Great guests, dynamic stories and interviews, plus new thoughts on a wide range of topics and concepts. I hope that you'll hang with me, Kevin McDonald, my friends, and of course, you, as together we work to understand why we are all here and what we can do to make our world a better place for all of us to be happy, be kind, and live in peace together. Yep, that's Positive Talk Radio. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Positive Talk Radio. It's a Monday, and it's a very nice day. Reverend Rob Lee is with us today. How are you, Reverend Rob? I am good, dear sir, my brother from another mother. How are you? I am really good. I'm looking forward to a great show today. We've got a very unusual topic, but it's a topic that I think its time is coming uh, and it may be coming sooner than we all would really kind of like it to, but uh, uh, Brian, uh, Dr. Brian Fisher is with us. He is an amazing guy, um, and I did not realize, uh, Brian, Dr. Brian, that, uh, that you've actually discovered a hundred new varieties of ants. Well, actually, I've discovered over a thousand new species of ants and described with colleagues from around the world, over 700 new species. New species is science. Um, that's how we document and describe who we share this planet with. That's, that, that's that, amazing. I, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> you know, some people think the greatest adventure is left on Earth is, you know, to go colonize uh, Mars, for example. But actually, it's often just in our backyard. But we have to go out with new eyes and look and ask these basic questions, you know. Who do we share the planet with? And, and you know what I love about that is I've always said all along, we know more about the moon than we do the depths of our own ocean. That, and, that and, and it's just, you know, all these different species that keep popping up. We think we, we know it all. And then there's a new ant that walks out and goes, yeah, you haven't met me yet. Hi, how are you? <laughs> you know, it's a basic question and it's just like food. We take it for granted because it's so basic, right? But it's actually very complex as we'll discuss later about, about the implications, right? So you could say, um, why do we need to actually document diversity? Well, it's because the same reason you say when you take a picture of like the moon or the stars, one picture doesn't really say much. But once you start documenting the fullness of it, it allows you to actually actually put humans in, in a new you know, context. And that context is our connection to the world around us. Without that connection to our food systems or to the life in general, we, we, we're going to be stuck. Well, Absolutely. you had mentioned in one of your writings that for the first time in history, that we are losing more species than we are gaining. Is that true? And what does that mean? Well, as we, when we describe new species, we can say we're documenting them, but the rate in which we document is actually quite slow. Yeah, I mean, for ants, for example, we only describe about 200 new species a year. Um, but in general, we're actually losing species because of this rapid diversity decline, where we're having dramatic effects on the environment now, reaching that tipping point where we start noticing that we're losing things. Now, we do notice when we lose something big, you know, if we lost all elephants, everybody would be talking about it. But we have hinted at that we are, the number and abundance of insects, for example, is changing. Um, if you just drive around the U.S. in the summer days, you'll notice that 30 years ago, you had a lot more insects hitting the windshield and a lot fewer now. That's just an example of the loss that's happening that being human, we just adjust that and go, oh, that's how many insects should be hitting our windshield without even realizing there was this abundance before that maybe if we saw that abundance now, we'd be grossed out by it. But actually, it's the beauty of nature. You know, one of the things that I remember when I was a kid, and and Rob, I'll bet you, since you were in uh, um, Florida, I'll bet you you do too. When I was a kid, there were bumblebees everywhere. 
And, uh, you know, you, you, if you had you had some flowers out, there were always bumblebees. Now I don't hardly see any. What's going on? Do you have any idea? Well, bumblebees are one of those uh, important species that impact an important process called pollination. And we do know that there has been a spillover of uh, pesticides that have impacted a lot of the bumblebees and bees um, around us. And those are, are, are important components. Now, we've tried to replace all the native bees with the imported bee to do the job of pollination. But, you know, there are amazingly diverse, over a thousand species, just like in Southern California, of bees. Um, it's just amazing. There are? Yeah, bees are super diverse. It's just phenomenal. And the peak diversity like of ants is like in the tropics. But for bees, it's like in an area between New Mexico and Arizona. There's just like the peak diversity of bees. Um, it's phenomenal. Interesting, Rob. Yeah, first off, see Glinda, Deborah, my tribe showing up. Bangarang, how are you girls? Glad you are here. Thank you very much. But uh, Dr. Fisher, I know one of the things I've noticed in, in my area of going missing were fireflies. I, you know, it used to be, a, you know, a yearly thing, all the kids out in the neighborhood catching fireflies. And I have not seen fireflies in my old neighborhood for years. Are, are fireflies being endangered or subsiding or is it the pesticide thing you're talking about? Well, what's happened there, I don't know locally, but in general, these issues of species decline with insects has impacted all of the insects and including um, those beautiful um, lanterns that light up at night that we all appreciate when we're camping in the, in the midwest and elsewhere but it's it's a, it's a sign that we are impacting the environment sadly we don't have like a dow jones index to the environment where we actually can say yes you know it's embarrassing right we don't even have the details to say this has changed um, and what's causing it. We haven't monitored biodiversity. And it's because somehow, for example, insects, you say, why? Why? Is, you know, why should we be studying the insects? Well, I think we're beginning to realize it's part of the glue that holds the world together. And without that glue, what's left? Um, in other words, I think finally we're realizing we're having an impact on the environment but often we don't make action. We don't, we're not taking the necessary steps. Um, and my fear is that by the time we get around to studying them, we would have lost so much that there's not much left to study. I agree. And now here's another, I think it depends on, it, it's sad to say for our society, what strikes us as cute. Like everybody with my thing was killer whales, you know? And so therefore the whale wars, all this stuff we're attracted to, but I don't think anybody thinks ants or roaches or some of these bugs are cute, so therefore they don't care. What do you think? Well, if they are cute, you do have an easier life, right? But I think we have to get beyond <laughs> beyond that, right? I um, agree. Um, we have to get beyond that, and our survival will depend on it. It's just like nobody finds money cute, but you can do a lot of things with it. And we have to realize that the environment is something that we need to do things. And that's living. If we expect our society to function even close to what we have now with a growing population and intricacy and, and social integration, we're going to have to figure out the environment and, and just not disease biology and epidemiology, but we have to figure out how systems work. And that's a great segue to get to talk about the other aspect of bugs is that you can eat them <laughs> and they're it's it's an incredible resource not just for functioning ecosystems but i think for the the food security of the planet well before we go there uh siglinda mm -hmm, that's right you has, a, has a question which is why are the beetles that look like ladybugs overpowering why so many have any idea what she's talking about um, maybe she's talking about ladybugs and overpowering, like, like there's so many of them. Um, well, they respond, you know, in general, the, the cycle of an insect, there's a moment where they're just like in your face because that's the peak diversity of them. Like butterflies come out during a certain season and same with ladybugs. They come out in a certain season and that abundance may be shocking, but it's actually just part of nature. Like you used to be able to go and see loads of seed turtles on the florida coast you know you don't see that anymore and it's different 
But there are beetles that can it can hurt you, right? There's some that actually spray acid and so forth. But I just You're think kidding. I had no idea. The bombardier beetles are incredible. Yeah, what see, Glenn is talking about is the Asian lady beetle. And it looks a lot like, I mean, it looks like a ladybug. But instead of having like four black dots, it's covered in black dots. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but they're eating everything is, is what's going on. So, I mean, I think that's what she was talking about. See, Glenn, if I got it wrong, let me know. But uh, yeah, I had heard the same thing. And because... A lot of people have to be warned. Make sure you're looking at the dots before you bring that beautiful little creature <laughs> into your home or into your garden. Do you know anything about those? Yes. Well, we, humans love to transport other insects around, you know, um, and ants included, right? And it's an interesting phenomena where you bring an insect that's not native to a new place. And some of it just gets squashed by the, the natives that outcompete it. But many times you bring in a new species and it's free of its disease. It's free of everything that used to compete with it back home because they evolved in the same uh, environment. And they're just free to actually usurp the energy flow in the system to grow to incredible abundance. And all, often that abundance is temporary in terms of evolutionary terms, but ecologically, it's a huge impact on us. So for the next 20 years, that species may be super abundant because nothing's impacting it, but eventually, usually a disease, a virus, a fungus will come along and start competing with it and reducing the population. Cool. So they can they can actually harm a dog if, they, if the dog eats them and puts them in their mouth kind of thing? They actually, that's where I heard about it. I think it was Dr. Paul or something like that. They're eating the plants, or the and and these don't digest or crunch. They actually kind of grab hold inside and hold on up in their gums and form, and uh, they're they're very harmful. Yeah. So uh, yeah, but they're so pretty, you know, <laughs> kind of like my ex wife, you know, very harmful, but uh, but bad looking. <laughs> so so dr brian one of the one of the reasons why we wanted to have you on was because we're going to talk about a subject right now first of all there are seven billion people on the planet and uh our food supply is going to at one point come in to question uh that we can feed everybody given what we currently are doing and you're working in madagascar because they've got a problem there and with uh, drought and uh, there's a and they're they're at risk of not being able to feed their population and you're working with a project to help them do that could you describe that project for us please right so food i can just back up if you just give me a moment to explain how i fell into this um yes, issue please. and I've, I'm a biologist. I've, I was drawn to Madagascar for the same reason you would be as a tourist because of its unique place. Like all the lemurs, the primates are only found in Madagascar, all over 130 species of them. And that's the same for most of the animal life and plant life of Madagascar. It's only found there because it was isolated. So it broke away from Africa along with India about 120 million years ago. And then India broke away from that chunk, moved north, dropped to Seychelles, hit Asia, formed the Himalayas, leaving Madagascar alone for about 80 million years. Now, during that time, if an animal by chance arrived there or a plant, it just evolved into something unique to fill the niche. It's kind of like that invasive beetle, right? It just arrived. And it's like, wow, this is great. I can go to town here. And over time, though, that's evolved unique life there. And that's what brought me there to go and explore. And I've described over a thousand new species of ants there and other taxa, other species. But to get to forest there, there's only about 10 percent of the forest left. And you have to make this an incredible human effort to go and get to that forest and you go there and you make these discoveries and you get back to the lab and two years later, you wanna go back to revisit what you discovered to learn more about it and then the forest is gone. Um, and you're like, well, we gotta go faster and get all these forests before it's gone. And we started doing that for like 20 years. We went to about 450 localities across the, the country with our Malagasy scientists and colleagues. But we realized that if we don't do something different, we didn't know how much force would be left in about 20 years. So we started looking at, well, what are the issues that are underlying why this force is being lost? And it's not like there's a giant 
deforestation program run by a, a corporation. It's actually people living around the forest, making daily choices about how to feed themselves and their kids. And it's that question, how do you put food in my stomach is driving deforestation. It drives them to go in and hunt the lemurs. It drives them to go in and cut down the forest to grow maybe corn for just a year because the soil is poor and then cut down more forest the following year. So we thought, is there anything we can do to actually stabilize that you know, issue about food security? And I thought, as an entomologist, I have nothing to contribute. But then it just hit me. Edible insects. We've seen everywhere we've gone to in Madagascar, the locals eating edible insects. And we thought, well, what if we could actually, instead of making that insect that's abundant for two weeks of the year, if we can make it abundant all year? So instead of just foraging for that insect, we can make it just as a, just like potatoes and rice, just right there at the doorstep so they don't have to go and cut down the forest. And that's what we began to do in Madagascar to use edible insects. But this dream, if we could provide food security, the people will stop being hungry in Madagascar, the children won't be malnourished, and we all will lessen the impact on the biodiversity, on the forest. You mentioned about one of the particular uh, uh, insects that are there. You called it the bacon bug, is that right? Yes, and so we didn't know much about the bacon bug initially. Um, we went around all over Madagascar, kind of surveying the attitudes, perceptions, and what they ate. We tallied up 130 species. But everywhere we went, what came as the, what the locals liked the most was the bacon bug. We don't, they don't call it the bacon bug. They call it secundri. But we call it the bacon bug because it tastes like bacon. You can just put it in a skillet and fry it up, and uh, you don't have to add oil or anything. And it's delicious. Um, and everybody loves the bacon bug. In fact, it even sells, if you have extra, you can sell it on the market the same price you sell shrimp. It's actually delicious. Rob? <laughs> okay. Now, here's my question, though, and I, I, I hear you, and I understand it, that in a perfect world, we breed these insects. Nature has a reason, though, for them not to be abundant year-round. What do these insects eat? eat great question why aren't they abundant um year round so the same thing as if you were a hunter right there'd be certain seasons you can go hunting or um, fishing or there's seasonality to all life and what we wanted to do is if if we could find the insects they like um the best and there's a couple that we chose if we could figure out the biology of the farming system so that they're not hidden during that other period or they're more they're constantly abundant in a way that we could do it in other words figure out how to farm like chickens you know they've you know over the last 30 years they've been able to really improve uh chicken growth by 400 percent they they improved their efficiency of conversion of chicken feed to you know um chicken um more efficiently but what if we could be doing the same through insects now i want to back up and say why even think of this it's because Insects are the most efficient converters of what you would consider waste, plant matter, into protein. They've had over almost 300 million years of time of evolution to actually be that efficient converter. And why insects? Also because they're not warm-blooded, like a chicken, like a hog, like a pig. In other words, you can actually, um, well, you don't have to waste all that energy on keeping your body cool or warm because you have to be warm blooded. So you can use a lot less water when you're growing them. And that's one of the beauties of it. And as it turns out, when you actually eat an insect, unlike like a steak or a chicken, there's a lot more available micronutrients for you. So there, you get more for your bang when you actually go and eat a, you know, a a spoonful of uh, cricket powder versus a spoonful of uh, uh, meat. Okay. So let's talk about crickets because that is one of the uh, species that you are working with to see if you can't solve the uh, hunger problem that is going on in Madagascar. So over half the species that they ate in Madagascar, and it's very similar to Africa, were orthoptera. These are the grasshoppers, the locusts, and the crickets. And we found out that 
there's many, many species because what they do is just choose the most abundant one that's locally available. So it's not like the bacon bug where it has to be that species to eat it because that's the tasty one. With the um, crickets, it didn't really matter. Or if whatever species we could actually farm, the end result, the taste was basically the same and the, they could use it in the same way of cooking. So they were happy with it. So we went from looking at grasshoppers and locusts, which ended up being very complicated to farm, to choosing crickets because it was just easier to farm. And that's where a lot of fun science began uh, in this process. I, as a scientist, I was worried I was giving up science to do this project. But as it turns out, it's all about science. We had to actually first figure out what species and figure out the technology to farm them. And then everywhere we went, there's a different habitat and different um, species of crickets. So we wanted to actually, we're changing our cricket species, no matter if we're going the desert versus the, the rainforest and or high in the mountains, it requires a different locally adapted cricket species to be able to farm. And it's been really fun figuring out all those kind of neat questions about how to farm at scale, not just like to feed a family, but to feed a whole nation. So wow. my qu I, again, I want I want to follow up on that, like with the bacon bug or crickets mm -hmm. or whatnot. What happens? And and remember, I'm from Florida, so there's a reason this pops into my head. Okay, uh, people brought, uh, you know, the the snakes, uh, pythons, Python. boas, things like that. Now they're not. Uh, you know, from this area. So that was that was really stupid to do to begin with, but they started farming, they were selling them, okay? And the little thing called Hurricane Andrew came through, wiped one of these farms out, and now the glades and they're invading into Miami and everything are actually there. They've become an invasive actual species. So the bacon bug is, are, are you saying we could move that from, one continent to another. And if something happens and I have my bacon bug farm and it get the fence get blown down or whatnot and they all escape, is there a danger or is it because of, of the bacon bug or the cricket of what they are that it's not going to hurt? You, you kind of see where I'm going. Is there, yep. you know? Um, yes, it's a good question. Some people, along the same line say, well, what happens if your building breaks and all the crickets get out? Well, they just eat all the local food, for example, other people. Well, why in Madagascar in particular, we don't want to introduce an invasive species. Um, that's just not the right direction we want to go. So right. that's why we're using local species. So we're actually farming a, a species that's abundant right outside. And that's why we keep okay. having to change species wherever we go and set up a farm in Madagascar because we want it to be a local species. So we have more work to do because we're not just farming one cricket species. We're farming a different cricket species based on the local habitat. Now, cricket farming is an international business right now. There's cricket farms in Florida, Canada, all over the world. I think there's like 10,000 in, in Thailand. And they all farm just two or three species around the world. So Already, people have found ways to control it, and they're often they're they're farming it. A uh, few species that are actually now so widespread, it, they, they, it's already out. <laughs> they're already everywhere now. If you're in Canada, they freeze in the winter and die, but in Florida, they're there on the coast. These uh, the local species. So, but we wouldn't want to bring the sakunji, for example, to Florida and farm it unless we are sure we can actually keep it there, and we'd prefer not to. So, we are only farming Sukundri where it's naturally occurring in Madagascar, the bacon bug, sorry, the bacon bug. We're only farming it in Madagascar because we have a mission not to find a way to make lots of money. We're finding a way to have a huge impact on people and help the biodiversity. So we've kind of built this from the ground up to actually make sure that we're benefiting biodiversity in Madagascar. Okay. Because I look, Kevin, check this out baconbug.com okay. <laughs> it's there but there's a you know coming soon to north america so somebody's already thinking 
that Brian's got the idea. They've got a, a pig with a ring in its ear and a bunch of worms, and they're talking about saving saving the lives of pigs, you know, and making vegan bacon better by using bacon bugs. I haven't really even catchy. seen that. <laughs> no, check it out. But it's but it goes into what we're saying. So now somebody's bringing a Madagascar bug over here. What would we have to worry about in the United States if the bacon bug broke, you know, broke loose? I was well, trying to find another. They won't be able to get a permit very easily. So it's a long process, okay. and and I don't think they'll be able to get it. You know, in, especially in Florida, maybe. Uh, in Canada, uh, you could because they have a big winter and they're not worried about it escaping. But I don't think so. But gotcha. the bacon bug is interesting. So um, bacon bug work is bacon done with bug. our colleague, uh, Courtney Borgeson, who's wonderful. And she's really gotten into this and is like really running with this project in one area of Madagascar. And we actually only kind of semi-domesticated farming the bacon bug. We haven't broke the secret yet. We uh. cannot large scale farm the bacon bug. It's semi-wild cultivation. Unlike the cricket, where we've kind of broken the system, we can farm them in a building, in a warehouse, at any scale right now. And the bacon bug still is, uh, uh, I really want to figure out how to do it at scale, but we haven't cracked it yet. So we still need to be actually in Madagascar farming that. So. <laughs> Dr. Brian, I wanted to ask you, and, and um, um, uh, Reverend Rob brought it up, the um, the introduction of the anaconda, and there's also a couple other large uh, constrictors that have been introduced into the Florida Everglades and stuff, and they can't find them, um, and they're growing, and they are they're disrupting the ecosystem. Do you have what's the scientific community think about that? Is that is that going to become a huge problem for, well, I, I mean, it already is a huge problem, but, but how are they going to, or is, are they going to be able to put the toothpaste back in the, in the tube, so to speak? So eradication of invasives is, is a, is a huge topic. And if you're a small island, like a bird sanctuary on an island, there's a lot of investment in eradication of cats, of goats, of other other uh, insects, even maybe even ants on Satakanalian Island, that that is impacting it. But once it's out in a huge area like Florida, there's like no way. So the cat is out of the bag, and there's no way of going back. Now you can kind of look for ways to have a, a check on them. Well, I think there's um, roundups now, but I don't know if that's having any impact at all. But eventually, not in maybe our lifetimes, but eventually nature will have systems other animals will learn to actually prey on them if they're allowed so if we have any other predators um there would be the bobcat i guess or something like that will learn to actually prey on them um like the eggs um somebody's got to love to eat python eggs right um so something eventually will learn to capitalize on that resource yeah i am so glad <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hate snakes, and I, you know, I just can just see there being like, well, did you hear about the the gentleman the other day that uh, was driving down the road? It was night at, at dark at night, and he ran into an he ran into an eleven foot alligator in the middle of the road, and 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 uh, ki and killed the alligator and himself because he oh, that sucks. He flipped the car and and ended up upside down in the ditch and and stuff like that. So I mean, where was that at? It's Florida. Okay, that well, that's why it didn't make the news down here. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so it's but it's tough, you know, because some of these some of these species. So, you know, I'm just glad that in where I live, it gets cold enough to where you know rattlesnakes and and all those things they don't want to live here. But um, it is so. interesting our acceptance of abundance of nature, right? I am. A, I really like about Florida that they do accept the abundance of alligators, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I mean, if you go to, I don't know, uh, Wisconsin and they get 200 wolves there, they go crazy, right? I mean, they just go like, there are more people being hurt by dogs, but all of a sudden, if one thing gets hurt by a, a, a wolf, all of a sudden it's out to get them because we have this historical baggage of always killing wolves and that we just can't get rid of it. Um, but um, somehow, Maybe because we, for some reason, that history is not there for alligators, and we still have them, and I love it. 
okay so let's turn back to now i'm i'm i i grew up in the food service industry and i would like you to tell me how we can package cricket so that people will eat them here well that's a great question because you know we have nothing but acceptance right now in madagascar like we cannot produce enough to meet the needs of our programs and so I, as a Westerner, was very worried about perception, right? And I was like, oh, let's watch, let's do this study to figure out if people eat it. It's never been an issue. For example, we have a school lunch program. We're worried about what age group the kids will actually, or if they're in the city versus the country. Well, we had all these studies going on, and it's never been an issue. Why? Because it tastes good. And it's tradition, right? Tradition is an important word there. And now we go to health clinics, and, and we try it there. Well, people want it. Well, they want it because... They see immediately the people that have cricket protein in their diet are responding to medication, are gaining weight, and are getting better. In fact, our tuberculosis clinic, where we first did the trial, half the patients had cricket powder, half of them didn't. Those who didn't did a sit-in and demanded, and they refused to eat unless their meals also had cricket powder. So bingo, it ruined our experiment, but everybody got cricket powder and everybody got healthier. Now all the clinics want cricket powder in Madagascar. And for famine relief, people love it too, but they're like, oh, maybe it's because they're hungry. They'll eat, you know, they'll eat anything, but it's not true. It tastes good. So to me, the challenge, if you go to the Western diet, is how do you get it the people to try it? Because if they try it, they'll already have, are, it's like just trying it's the gateway. If they can get over that initial hurdle, because it's not tradition, because it's new, those two things are the challenge. And one way to do it is to kind of just slip it into food um, as like hamburger helper. So I don't think people are going to be ordering up <laughs> a big bowl of cricket powder to serve at the dinner table. But they might realize that, oh, at the store, you know, this meat product's getting kind of expensive. But if I buy this over here with um, it's like a cheaper hamburger and I'll, I'll buy it and the kids love it. So bingo. And that's how we get it in. Cricket powder. Now, is it, um, I, I guess we're grinding up crickets. Um, do you grind them live? Do you kill them? Do you roast them first? Are they, you know, what's that's the a, stages of cricket powder? That's a great question for a couple of reasons. One, we wanted to actually um, produce something in Madagascar that was part of that tradition. So I went back and read all available literature for 400 years where any mention of the traditional diets of Madagascar. And in the earliest times, they remarked that in, in the South, they would say it like this. Every, you know, uh, household, any smart thinking household would have a stash of cricket, uh, of cricket powder, basically, in their home. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Why? Because of that time of plenty, because the powder is stable. So they could actually use it at any time. Even two years later, they could just use it. So they would, when locusts were plentiful, they would gather them up. They would even stop wars and gather up the locust boil them, lay them in the sun, and then when they dried, grind them into a powder. So we wanted to make a powder because that's how the locals did it. But as it turned out, it's actually the best way to conserve it. Once it's ground into a powder and sealed in a bag, it's good. It's got a shelf life of minimum two years. And that allows us to ship it anywhere in Madagascar for famine relief, for school lunch programs. It can just sit there, not in refrigeration, and then you know, you scoop it out and add it to your sauce for your hamburger helper, whatever, or your spaghetti sauce or your sauce on your rice. Um, so that's the beauty of it. But if you talk about farming practices, the beauty of farming crickets is that you don't harvest them like a cow in their youth. You don't harvest them before they become an adult. You actually harvest the cricket at the end of its life. After it's already laid eggs, if it's a female, after it's already mated, if it's a male, and we time our harvest three days before they would die naturally. And that allows us to maximize egg production, reproduction for the next batch. And then they are about to die. We don't want them to die before we harvest. So we harvest them and we use, we just put them asleep. Um, and you can do that with the CO2 and our large scale farms. That's how we do it. And then they just actually are, are killed then. And then we put them in the oven and dry them, and then we grind them in a giant food grinder. But before you do that, <laughs> you harvest their poop. Yes. And this was like 
a, a surprise benefit in the whole process. I don't know of any oh, other industry. Bet. We're just farming, farming, farming. Then we're like, well, they produce a lot of poop. And as it turns out, this cricket frass is a brilliant fertilizer. And we are actually selling um, the fertilizer right now and testing it in reforestation and vegetable gardens because we think we can offer. Um, you may have mentioned that at the local village level, they're cutting down the forest and cutting down more forest because the soil is, is not sustainable to keep farming on it. But we're producing this magic fertilizer that actually extends and bioactivates the soil. In the U.S., people are buying cricket fertilizer from the cricket farms. Do you know who is? It's the marijuana industry. And they're paying top dollar. For the, <laughs> See what happens? <laughs> for the cricket frass because it's so good. You don't only have to apply it once. Unlike chemical fertilizers, it doesn't leach out. You don't have to keep applying it. And it, it we first started just with like vegetable gardens. And now we're going on to cash crops like corn. But when we started adding it to reforestation projects, we realized that our farming of crickets could have a net gain to the environment where we're actually not, not just reducing the impact, our newer is bringing landscapes back around where we're farming. And this is why I think it's a brilliant solution, cricket farming. I, I think it probably is. A, I, right now, I've just got a picture. Hey, Bill! <laughs> What are you doing with your cricket crap? Well, you know, I make these great tomatoes. And it really works well on the psychedelics. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but, you know, I'm, tell me about, because I have seen, and you, we can buy cricket powder now. You can get it on Amazon um, as a protein powder. So is the protein really that much higher? So if somebody had a bowl of noodles and we put cricket powder on them, uh, what, like a tablespoon, a teaspoon, whatnot, are they really getting that much more protein because it's that high protein packed? Yes, it's between 55 and 65% protein. Um, you know, a chicken's like 28%. Uh, so it's much more than like a, 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 a chicken or a beef uh, um, or, or, or just our standard meats. It's super high dense protein. And so initially our attraction was to protein, especially in a place like Madagascar where there is no protein alternative. It's that's it is is there's nothing you can do. There's no protein. You can't put more cows on degraded landscapes. You can't cut down more forest when there's no more forest. And so it. It's not like you can import soy or corn and, and it, it outcompetes that completely because of the, of the protein richness of it. And we're farming it on kind of waste products, weeds and stuff. Um, but it's more than just the protein. So it's really important um, if you have an, or fighting anemia, it, it has a lot of important iron in it. And more so, there's a lot of micronutrients in it. Recent studies um, by some teams in um, uh uh, and Virginia Tech showed that it actually really improves the gut microbiome. And this could be why in the clinic setting, children are responding so well because they're, you know, they, they're sick and they have diarrhea. But once they start on cricket powder, they, they, they're, they're just absorbing more nutrients. Maybe that we're just passing through before. It's Good interesting. It's, yeah. It's, it's now uh, Siglinda has a question for you. So what do these harvesting farms feed the crickets? That's a, you know, a super important question, right? And, and, and it gets that really why insects are so interesting. Um, first, you could, you could talk about conversion rates. Like if you have a pound of feed, how much protein do you get at the end? How much animal do you get at the end? And as it turns out that it's compared to like cows or pigs, it's super efficient. Like there's so many more times uh, the conversion rate for crickets. But as it turns out, it's very similar, but better than a chicken. So we have to look at just more the conversion rate. You have to start looking at maybe protein retention. So you can say, well, how much if you give it a certain amount of, if your feed has a certain amount of protein in it, how much protein can you access when you're done? Well, 
that involves like what edible portion is it? So with the chicken, you don't eat the feathers, right? But with the um, cricket, you eat everything and you don't eat the bones maybe. And culturally that differs around the world. So some people eat the head, some others don't. All that has to go into account. But more than that, it's also the feed. So when we talk about cricket farming and our kind of carbon footprint and our footprint, it's the whole life cycle, the whole food chain. How much did it, that feed travel to get, actually get to where we're actually feeding the crickets? And what we're doing is taking advantage that these crickets are, are able to eat a much kind of lower grade waste product than like a chicken. And we're able to use ag byproducts like leaves um, of, um, of this product that they love to eat in Madagascar called manioc or cassava. And we take the leaves from there. We take other ag, bag, um, ag byproducts like bran, for example, or brewer yeast, and add that and make our recipe based on what is locally available. So we have to transport it very far. And that actually reduces our cost tremendously in terms of farming because our model assumes that we are going to get basically free feed um, based on the weeds and, and uh, whatever we can get locally. So when we go to an area to farm, we have to first go there, figure out what species, biologically, what's the locally adapted cricket species. And second, we have to actually survey the feed that might be available. That's the weedy plants or egg bag products, and then make a recipe that works with that cricket species. And that's the science again. It doesn't work unless you do both of those. So we have two programs in Madagascar. We have our large farm program and our small farm program. Our large farm is massive scale where we really care about efficiency and really cost because we're trying to provide a product for famine relief. And you would think, well, that shouldn't be too hard. Well, it is because you have <laughs> the United States, World Food Program donating all this stuff to like Madagascar. And we're saying, oh, we can produce something locally, but everything else is basically free. It's a really competitive market. So we have to actually, to get our product into the hands of UNICEF and World Food Program, we have to produce something super efficiently at scale to feed like a million people. Uh, and that's been a challenge we're working on right now. And we're just opening actually on April 15th, our first large scale farm of about 20,000 square feet to test this model. Now, we also have small farms, and this is really exciting, where we go to like that health clinic of tuberculosis who says, we want cricket, and can we do it ourselves? Yes. So we have these farms now that we can actually establish in a school, a, even a prison, a health clinic, where we can actually go there ahead of time, figure out what cricket species, what's the local feed, and give them a starter kit. And one by one, we can actually build resilient, empowered ability to actually provide their own protein source. And it's super satisfying. It doesn't scale very fast. It takes a lot of work, but it actually in the long run, it'll be the, the long-term solution for feeding, I think, the future, especially at schools, health clinics, and prisons in Madagascar. Well, now, one of the things that, uh, I, being a former chicken salesman, I worked for a vertically integrated chicken farm. And uh, one of the things is, is that when they raise it, it, as an example, you're right. They've changed the, the chemistry so that they can now grow a, uh, a chicken to weight, three and a half, four pounds within six to eight weeks. And it used to take 10 to 14 weeks in order to get the same thing done. But Wait till they, you see that cricket. <laughs> <laughs> can, and they also they also use. Um, you know, grains and feeds and things that you can feed the humans to feed the chickens, that if you can get away with feeding the chickens less uh, quality stuff, and then that leaves more stuff for us to, to consume as, as people. But the other thing is um, chicken farmers, and it's not widely talked about, but they do use antibiotics and they do trying to keep the flocks healthy while the chickens are growing and stuff. Do you have to do the same thing with crickets? Do you have to feed them um, things to keep the flock healthy? Um, no, we are using native species and, and one advantage of having an arsenal of different species that we can farm is that if by chance a, a health issue like a virus comes out and wipes out one species, it's usually specific to a species and we can just shift to another um, cricket species to farm. And we can ramp up very quickly. One brilliant thing is that 
um, you can actually produce a lot of eggs <laughs> in six weeks and you can actually just scale up a cricket farm starting from nothing in six weeks. So it's, it's exciting that way. Um, but, I, you know, this idea of, of mass farming is really the only way to think about insect farming, just like you think about crickets. This idea of vertical farming at massive scales, that is how cricket cricket farming will be in Madagascar if we want to address um, the, the acute need right now. And we're trying to figure out, and actually for me, when I began this project, it was just small scale farming. But when this huge famine started happening, it really changed my vision in a sense that I want to see cricket farming in Madagascar at a level that we don't have to import all the soy and, and, and corn from overseas as a band-aid. I think there's no reason Madagascar can't address the social issues themselves. We have such a wonderful, enthusiastic Malagasy team, and I, they're making great strides every week in figuring out how to farm better with less time, less water, less feed. And it's exciting. So, you know, they've had 50 years to do this to chickens. And I think in the next few years, we'll be having incredible breakthroughs too. Now, I'm assuming... Now, this is what uh, Sir Glinda is, says that I'm assuming since it's, it's natural in their crickets that they're safe to eat. But have there been studies done on bioproducts and human health when humans consume the crickets? Yes, there's been a huge number of studies. You know, um, edible insects did enter the human food chain uh, in a big way about 10 years ago, uh, along with, you know, the pet industry. Now all the pet food has it already, if you didn't know it. Um, and and so there's been lots and lots of studies. And they've reaffirmed a basic premise that, um, you know, we're not related very closely to insects. And therefore, there's nothing that gets transmitted from an insect uh, like a cricket to us if we eat it, unlike pigs, chickens and cows. Right. There is no um, disease like mad cow disease or avian flu or something like that that we have to worry about coming from a insect like a cricket um, and that's the, the the beauty of it now that said people are allergic to like crustacea um, clams or shrimp right and insects are related to crustacea and therefore those people who have an allergy to um, shellfish or shrimp for example they should go slow in the beginning when they start eating crickets or insects just to see if that also would impact them some don't at all but some may do you really think going slow <laughs> when you start eating crickets is going to be an issue kevin for our show <laughs> on the 11th or the 12th while we were sitting here i'm on amazon cricket bites there is a cheesy ranch a buffalo wing sauce and hickory smoked bacon. I just ordered a variety pack, and we'll try them on the show the, for something new for the week of the eleventh. Oh no, we're gonna do we're gonna do that to win in Florida. That's for sure. <laughs> I, so, I'll fly yeah. down. I'll fly down for that. I did have a question for you. Um, <laughs> you betcha. I you will. laugh, but you're gonna enjoy eating those. Uh, hey, if it's out like this, I'll try it. I'll try it. I have so, to tell you how I eat it every morning because, okay. you know, in Madagascar, it's easy to eat it the traditional way, which is like adding it to a sauce like lentils that go on rice. That's, you just take a spoonful. That's all you have to do. But that doesn't really match. I don't eat rice every meal like they do in Madagascar. So here in the U.S., I just love yogurt in the morning. And instead of granola, I add a spoonful of, of cricket powder and stir it in. And, and it's delicious. And it's just a great easy well, way. And that's what these are actually the whole dried cricket. So, so uh, I, I, we're going to go big, go big right. or go home, you know? So they, if, if this turns into Jeff Goldblum and the fly, you know? they, by, by the way, they introduced those as a novelty item at Safeco Field 
uh, for where the Mariners play in Seattle. They no longer have that on the menu. <laughs> Well, they're because, coming out of Oregon, so it's probably the surplus. <laughs> exactly. I did have a question for you, because, and it has to do with cows, because one of the environmental impacts of, of having too many cows is the uh, effect of cow farts on the, uh, and methane in the, uh, in the world. Uh, do I don't know this. I'm sure you do. Do crickets fart? Um, no, they're not farting, right? No, methane is a byproduct of, of rumination and so forth, and it's... It's not an issue at all um, for a cricket farm. Wow. So uh, actually, if we could decrease the amount of beef that we are using, and uh, that would actually save the planet in that, in that respect as well. You know, there's no way that we're going to reduce anything, right? I think what we're talking about it is it's like human population is increasing. It's doubled in the last you know, 50 years. It's going to double in the next 30 years, like in Madagascar. So we can't even feed everybody right now right and you know it's just like when your bank account goes below zero uh, everything's just dandy right until it's below zero right and and for pe those people who are hungry that's below zero they have to make new choices and it's whether or not we as a community before our collective bank account goes below zero if we're willing to actually test and try something new and i urge everybody who's listening to go and try something new well, I applaud you. I applaud you, Reverend Rob. You are you. You're the you're the man, man. We're gonna try it, brother. Now We're gonna is, try it. Are there any of the tribe that live close to you? Like uh, we could put them on the on the air, and they could you guys could eat it together. I I like uh, Siglinda. Is she close to you? It would be fun no, for her. She's in Jersey, but there are quite a few people in Florida. So uh, you know, but they're they're spread out all over Florida. So we'll have to see. I'll put that out there to see who wants to try it. You know, and maybe we'll send them a Zoom link and we can all be on. And, you know, what got me was the flavors, you know, buffalo chicken ranch, uh, ranch cheese. And uh, yeah, you know, crunchy, cheesy ranch. Yeah. OK. Well, you know, I got I got a question for those of you that are listening and now and later, you know, they've got this new hamburger that is a meatless hamburger patty and it tastes just like a regular hamburger patty. Have you ever looked at the ingredients of what's in that? No, um, I have I not. I would venture to guess most people have not because it tastes, it looks like, and it tastes like a hamburger, then they might think that it has stuff that's good for it. But I can tell you, a lot of that stuff is engineered stuff, and it is not natural uh, for them to put it together like that. And so they could throw some... Uh, some cricket powder in there and uh, it would probably do really quite well. Kevin, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, nobody, it, the sales are booming for that. Right. And so people love it. And they they don't keep up what's in it. exactly. And I think, you know, people realize we'll probably find out in 10 years, all that stuff's killing us. Right. And we're not <laughs> even interested in it because it tastes good. Right. And so we just got to get people willing to try it. Ain't going to be bugs for me, laugh out loud. Well, if I was starving, <laughs> maybe. You see, this is what we're up against. Now, I, have you tried that um, Beyond Beef or whatever? Um, it's um, it's amazing. I, I have. But do I still eat it? Nope. <laughs> do I look Somebody like? <laughs> yeah. No, they are. It's very it's very huge. And, um, and, and by the way, um, I do for anybody that says that they don't want bugs in their diet. Um, if you're eating any processed foods in the United States, you already have bugs. Oh in yeah. Your diet. Oh yeah. Another oh, question I we get often from vegetarians who are willing to try it. Like oh, I can't stand the fact that you're killing an animal. And, and interesting enough though, the vegetarians have never thought about the process of farming when they actually go and harvest like lettuce or something or tomatoes. The actual machinery kills more insects than you would in our farm, right? I mean, the whole process of farming of, of vegetables kills a lot of insects, not, not to mention the pesticide. Yeah, the ecosystems we wipe out plowing up a field to plant our uh, organic, you know, vegetables for the, yeah, we, we you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, and we need to stop and 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 think about that. I think that's a valid point. You know, but I think kind of like what you said, there will be wacky people like me that will try it, 
and see like there. Now, am I going to keep crickets stocked on my shelf? Not even if I like it. Okay. It, it'll be one of those things where it'll be one of those few things, but it lets you know how much we are not facing hunger. And it gives us something to be thankful for and grateful for in this country that we're not resorting to, hey, <laughs> you know, when's it going to be soil like green? We're going to start killing old people three days before they're dead, you know, and we'll have Charlton Heston running down the street. It's people, you know, or whatnot. But we're not hungry enough. You know, when you get hungry, you'll eat. Unless it's the bacon bug. Yeah. No, I think when you get hungry, you'll eat. And I looked them up. They look like mealworms, Kevin. So I'm, whenever we can get some over here, I'll try them too. Uh, I'm hoping they're dead. I don't I don't want to be like... See, now, now, my brother back in the 70s, he had it in his mind that he was going to take earthworms, and he, he uh -huh. bought an earthworm farm, and then he put them on a cookie sheet and baked them and then put them into a protein powder. I do crickets before I do earthworms in a protein. Yeah, no, I've seen, you know, getting an earthworm ready to for fishing or whatnot. Yeah, what comes out of it? Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. So, no, so. no, 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 no. So, uh, uh, Dr. Brian, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, how do they do that? Oh, I'm easy to find online. Um, I work at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. And um, you can find me. You can email me. And... Uh, I'm on Twitter at Ant Explorer. We are going to, we're changing our format a little bit, and we're going to be going uh, from uh, uh, four o'clock or two o'clock to four o'clock uh, Pacific time, which is five to seven Eastern time. C can we have you back in a couple, three weeks and uh, I would love have, to. have you go through that? <laughs> and even, even for the, uh, the, once you get the, the uh, crickets in, Rob, we can, we could have him back for that show and we could talk about it. I leave yeah. from Madagascar, and if I'm in Madagascar, um, I'm I can join you from there. What, That'd be great. And I'll it? even try to get one of my kids on uh, here with me and see if they'll give it a shot. You know, and just to see their face. So what to, what time is it in Madagascar right now? It's um it's about a, it's eleven or ten hours difference, depending on if they've done their time change or not. And um, I'll be leaving. I'll be there. I leave here the April nineteenth. Oh, it's perfect. We might be able to catch you before then. Yep. We'll see if my, uh, just be on standby for when my crickets come in. Cause I'll know, <laughs> I'll notify Kevin and, uh, yeah. and then I'll tell you my favorite flavor. <laughs> I, I admire your guts, young man. <laughs> I admire you. What you'll do for science is just amazing. Absolutely. You know, you won't see this on hell's kitchen. <laughs> No, but you know it might be a show one day. Um, that's that, that could be true. So, but you know what? We got to try stuff like this. So you're right. We do, Doctor Brian Fisher. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's been such a pleasure. My pleasure. For the best and of you, eat bugs. Eat, <laughs> eat bugs right off the windshield. That would be fun. So, <laughs> thank you very much, Rob. I'll see you on the other side. We have another show that we're going to do right after this. And so we'll be we'll be back here in just a few minutes. So on uh, uh, um, Tarot with an Attitude and Positive Talk Radio, the YouTube channels. So stay with us. We'll be right back. And and Dr. Brian, thank you so much for being here. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for enjoying this episode all the way to the end. Please give us a like and subscribe to this channel. This has been a production of KMMedia.pro. Please visit our website, oddly enough, named kmmedia.pro for more details about us and our mission, which is to provide great, positive programming designed to inspire us all. I'm Kevin McDonald, and I'm proud of these shows, and I truly hope that you'll like them and share them with friends and family. So on behalf of our entire team, remember, be kind to each other, because each other's all we've got. We'll see you next time.